The resignation of Craig Kelly from the Liberal Party and from government has enforced the trope of the high-minded conservative loser. But the Liberal Party is vulnerable to a right-wing takeover. Kelly should have stayed and called for that. My fellow Australians, I'm John Andrews and welcome to another episode of Advancing Australia. The political parties, particularly the Liberal Party state branches, are weak and ready to be taken over by true right-wing supporters. And in this video, I'm going to demonstrate just how weak they are, how few people are needed, and how little someone actually needs to do to bring about true right-wing change in this country. We will examine the state of the Liberal Party by looking at several pre-selection battles between federal parliamentary candidates and the incredibly small numbers of people that are voting in those party elections, particularly in safe seats that are shaping the destiny of right-wing politics. At the 2019 election, Craig Kelly received nearly 60% of two-party preferred votes in the swing seat of Hughes. Located in southwestern Sydney, first winning the seat in 2010 and holding it since then. According to news.com.au, upon his uh, resignation from the party, he said, quote, I felt that for the rest of this parliamentary term, if I'm going to act and speak according to my conscience and beliefs, I can do so more effectively as an independent, end quote. According to media reports, Kelly has more than 90,000 followers on Facebook, where he often has much higher engagement than either the Prime Minister or the opposition leader. He is also a regular on Sky News and an outspoken MP. According to Michelle Grattan, writing in The Conversation, Kelly had been stalked by another candidate seeking Liberal pre-selection. And two important pieces of information link, uh, uh, come from that article linked below. Quote, Hughes local Kent Johns, a councillor in the Sutherland Shire, end quote, and quote, Johns, who is ex-Labor and an industrial chemist with a committed position on climate change, end quote. The media have been gunning for Kelly for many years now. He entered Parliament in the huge swings to the Liberal Party off the back of Tony Abbott's leadership of the opposition. On Monday the 22nd of February, The Guardian reported polling that showed that Kelly's electorate of Hughes, quote, believed his social media posts are irresponsible with his climate denialism further eroding his popularity, end quote. What that article failed to report was that the polling company is owned by the CFMEU and the ACTU and is the polling company of choice for activist groups like GetUp and Greenpeace and media like Sydney Morning Herald and Melbourne's age. It was commissioned and executed specifically to target and weaken Kelly, particularly in the media. He has been very strong on coal in the past and has spoken in a manner that is outside of the normal left-wing framing of debates. This has made him a target of the media and they have used every opportunity to make that a headache for the Prime Minister. Quitting the Liberal Party is the worst possible thing Kelly could have done. He is immensely popular and has a media profile, profile far higher than many government ministers. He could have used his profile to push the issues within the tent of government and the party room. Sadly, I think he will join the ranks of Corey Bernardi and other failed conservatives that have put their principles ahead of their ability to exert power. That is to say that conservatism fails when it when its champions put respect for institutions and the platform they have ahead of their policy principles and their ability to speak out about the issues for which they care. That is to say, they put the office and the platform of the party room ahead of the power it can exert. I call this the trope of the high-minded conservative loser. Kelly should have stayed and fought and drawn out the lefties within the Liberal Party. If Kelly wanted to advance the ideas down the field, he would have been better doing it in the party room. This is what leftist agitators do all the time. They change the institutions and that is what we must start doing. And that is the theme of this essay. In January this year, the Liberal Party in the seat of Menzies replaced the long time sitting member Kevin Andrews with a challenger an ex-soldier with three tours of duty in Afghanistan under his belt. 
Kevin Andrews first entered the parliament in 1991 and he was a minister within the Howard government from 2001 to its defeat in 2007, including time as a cabinet minister from 2003 to 2007. He was a very senior member of the Howard government. And he was as he was during the Abbott government as a cabinet minister from 2013 to 15. Indeed, it has been reported that he was one of Abbott's strongest supporters. Mem Menzies is a very safe blue, is very safe blue ribbon Liberal Party heartland, and Kevin Andrews represents a very old school conservatism. At the last election, the electorate, electorate of Menzies had a constituency of 107, 107,000 electors, and Kevin Andrews won the seat he had held since 1991 by a margin of 14. 800 votes, even with a swing against him. The successful challenger is Keith Wallahan, and from research I can gather that he was born in Dublin, Ireland. He's a Cambridge educated barrister. He was a captain in the 2nd Commando Regiment, a Special Forces Regiment of the Australian Army. His page on the Victoria Bar Association website outlines some of his work history and notes, quote, after a series of deployments overseas as an officer of the ADF, Keith returned to practice with Blake Dawson. At various times, he was also employed as a tutor in the fields of criminal and constitutional law at the University of Melbourne. Keith was educated at the University of Melbourne whilst completing officer training at Duntroon and was also educated at Monash University, where he was later awarded the Sir Charles Lowe Prize for Best Advocate. He later completed a Masters of International Relations at the University of Cambridge. On the 2011 Australia Day Honours list, he was decorated with commendation for distinguished service for performance in duty in action with the ADF in 2009 and 2010, end quote. I managed to find a video on YouTube uh, of him speaking on the issues of, quote, a colorblind constitution, end quote, and speaking about his opposition to an apology to the so-called stolen generations and against racial thinking and racializing our constitution and the institutions and speaking against recognition of Aboriginal people in the Constitution, which at this point is current government policy. It's a very interesting speech and the link is in the description below and I do recommend it. According to The Age in Melbourne in an article written before the pre-selection vote, quote, 300 local members in Ivanhoe. Party operatives with knowledge of the group of votes voters predict a tight race that could be determined by non-rusted on voters who make up their mind on the day." End quote. Further, it was widely reported that Kevin Andrews had endorsements from John Howard, Tony Abbott, Matthias Cormann, Peter Credlin and Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Right now, with the limited information that we have about Wallahan, it seems he might be a sound man. He has runs on the board in the military. He is on the record speaking against those that would seek to divide our citizens by race. We don't know where he stands on abortion or the use of government institutions to further our social aims. We don't know where he stands on the right for children to grow up naturally and unmutilated by the medical industry. But he does seem very sound on nationalism, on nationhood, as you would expect from a special forces officer. But what I want to focus on, what we do know are the numbers, that 300 party members decided the fate of one of the safest seats in the country, a seat that has held a federal cabinet minister for two separate terms of government. The vote to change candidates at the next federal election was decided by a margin of 70 votes, 181 to Wallahan and 111 to Andrews. As a military man, Wallahan would recognise what I see and what you should see. The major parties are strategically vulnerable. A membership of 300 voting members is strategically vulnerable and tactically weak. Another example is Bronwyn Bishop's battle for pre-selection in the seat of McKellar. The seat of McKellar is on the northern beaches of Sydney. In April 2016, the Conservative stalwart Bronwyn Bishop was dumped in a pre-selection contest within the Liberal Party. After a 29-year stint in both the Senate and the seat of McKellar, she lost 51 to 39 to Jason Falinski, who has since advocated for policies to increase energy prices that will impact Australian employment and manufacturing. There were 91 eligible pre-selectors to vote. 
Within that electorate, the Federal Party received 65% of the two-party preferred vote in the federal election of that year, 2016. And in 2019, the most recent federal election, 63.2% of the two-party preferred vote. This is another very safe Liberal seat where 91 Liberal Party members determined who the sitting member would be and they picked a man who has championed policies relating to leftist priorities. There are more than 108,000 voters in the electorate of McKellar. Prior to writing this, I had never heard of Jason Falinski. His YouTube channel has 91 subscribers. He has a range of clips of him talking about the Northern Beaches, Science Week grants, coastal erosion. But also on YouTube, I found a video titled, quote, Jason Falinski wants to get to net zero emissions before 2050, end quote. And that's him appearing on ABC News 24. Here is a member of the Liberal Party in a very safe seat advocating left-wing policies from within a supposedly conservative government. He has no profile in wider Australian politics, yet the right candidate in that seat could be a major force in driving the debate and promoting true right-wing policies. In the 2019 federal election in that same seat of McKellar, the Christian Democratic Party, the Fred Nile Group, received 1,401 primary votes. That is to say there are 15 times as many hardcore conservative Christian voters in that safe Liberal seat than there are members of the Liberal Party eligible to pre-select a member. In the YouTube video of Polinsky where he appears on ABC24, he mentions his parliamentary colleague and ideological friend Trent Zimmerman, another left-winger who took over the relatively safe Liberal seat of North Sydney after the retirement of Joe Hockey in 2015. He won pre-selection for that seat 47 to 35 votes of a possible 84 electors. In fact, prior to being elected as the member of North Sydney, he was on Joe Hockey's staff. He represents the very worst of the political class, a clique of insiders removed from the concerns of ordinary Australians. In his first speech to Parliament in March 2016, he spoke about his homosexual identity and the gay Mardi Gras, and I will link that video below in the description. Again, in this electorate, there are 1,600 conservative Christian Fred Nile Group voters. Voters that could have been active in the Liberal Party, ensuring a truly conservative voice in that safe seat. The same could be said for Julian Lesser in the seat of Barara in the northern outskirts of Sydney, where the ALP routinely struggle to get around 19% of the vote. There is an evident pattern. Party membership numbers are very low and the local branches who have ultimate control over who the candidates are in an electorate could be influenced by very few new members. How to join the Liberal Party and what to do. In New South Wales, the Liberal Party is divided by the federal electorates. When you join, you'll need to use your residential address and it will need to match the electoral role of the AEC. A basic membership is $100 a year, or if a student or over 60, it's $40 a year. I found that out myself yesterday. There is an impression that political parties are full of policy eggheads having deep and esoteric discussions about the nuances of policy, but that is not the case. At a local level, the parties are made up of regular people who have families and regular jobs or small businesses, and they want to help their country. All you need to do to have an impact on Australian politics is go along to two meetings a month, pay your membership fee, talk to other party members about the issues that you are concerned about, and participate. The rules for selecting committee members and voting by selectors are covered by Appendix F of the New South Wales Liberal Party Constitution. I've linked that below. However, the only disqualifying factor for being a, a selector, for voting in a selection committee, is if you are a relative of a candidate. Okay, so here's the conclusion of this essay. Changing politics by voting for a minor party is a delusion. The only meaningful way to elect a politician from a minor party is to vote for them in the Senate, but in order for you to vote, for your vote to count, you must number every box below the line. The major parties and the Greens change voting rules such that above the line votes extinguish rapidly in the new preference system. 
The weakness of the Liberal Party has been demonstrated. The only meaningful way to make an impact in right-wing politics is to join the Liberal Party. Plant the seed in your mind. What would happen if you joined your local political party and talked about the issues that we talk about, the issues that matter? Let's say that 30 people joined a branch and changed 30 people's minds on an issue that we care about. Suddenly the party, that branch of the party, is totally different. The local candidate is always reliant on their local branch to have their candidacy confirmed, even before they go to the wider electorate, to the poll. Think about what happened to Bronwyn Bishop. She was defeated in her pre-selection battle, but she lost 51 to 39. So 90 votes, 90 voting members of the Liberal Party decided the outcome of a safe parliamentary seat. You've seen other examples. Craig Kelly would have allies, strong allies in the party room and the government if a cohort of strong right-wing voters joined the party. It would be those soft left voices on the outer, not the strong right voices. Craig Kelly, so, okay, sorry. So I hope that you understand what I'm talking about here. The examples of the votes in the pre-selections are perfect illustrations of what we can do and need to do. Push the political parties to the right. It's possible. We need to have faith in the process and what happens in the parties is more important than what happens in the parliament. What that means is that the quality of the elective pool that determines the quality of the candidate. A left-wing electoral committee will get left-wing policies, and the reverse is true. A member elected by a right-wing selection committee that then goes against the wishes of that committee is finished. But a left-wing member elected by a left-wing committee is only going to be responsible to the wider electorate, and in a safe seat, that doesn't matter. So the character, the nature of the selection pool needs to change, and we could do that over the coming months. If these issues can be sorted out internally by the local branches, members in the governing party room will have the confidence to overcome the advisors, the operators and staffers that are risk averse when it comes to right wing issues. We need to give the members of parliament the courage to know that they have the support of the party back home. All will have to fear us should they fail to keep faith with the position they earned. Join the Liberal Party. All right, just like to thank you for uh, watching this video. You can help by sharing this with your friends. Um, give us a like, a comment. If you've got any ideas for future discussions you'd like to have, any future videos, um, that'd be great. Reach out, you can contact me via the links below and uh, let's, help, uh, let's help change the country. Cheers.